Mmm. 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 This angel food cake is so good. No wings yet. Guess I'll eat some more cake. What are you doing? Um, looking to see if my angel wings are sprouting yet. Angel wings? Well, I certainly don't want to sprout buffalo wings. I'm a little confused here. What's going on? I'm eating angel food cake, so I'll turn into an angel. Um, I hate to tell you this, but eating angel food cake will not turn you into an angel. But if I don't turn into an angel, I won't be able to go to heaven. Oh, so that's what this is about. You want to know how to go to heaven. Yeah, heaven sounds awesome. Oh, no! Now what? I just thought of something. I hope I don't have to eat dog food to get to heaven. Dog food? Ew, gross! Why would you think eating dog food would get you into heaven? Well, I saw this movie once called All Dogs Go to Heaven. If I eat dog food, maybe I'll turn into a dog and I'll get to heaven that way. Oh, silly. Eating angel food cake or gross dog food won't get you to heaven. So how do I get to heaven? Well, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus? But wasn't he just a good man who lived a long time ago? No. Jesus was much more than that. Jesus is the Son of God. He left heaven and was born as a baby here on earth. He grew up and never did anything wrong. You mean he never talked back to his parents or told a lie, thought mean thoughts? Never. Jesus lived a perfect life here on earth. Wow. The bad things people think or say or do is called sin. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, our sin separates us from God, who is holy and righteous. Sin will keep us from going to heaven. But if everyone has sinned, that means no one can go to heaven. You're right. No one can get to heaven by themselves. That's why we need Jesus. Jesus willingly died on the cross and took the punishment for our sins himself. Why would Jesus do that for me? Because he loves you very much. Listen to this song my friends will sing.
Jesus loved me enough to die for me. Three days after Jesus died on the cross, he came back to life and now lives in heaven. You mean Jesus is alive? He sure is. And the Bible tells us that the blood of Jesus can wash away our sins and make us clean before God. Oh, but I take baths every night. I'm already clean. You may be clean on the outside, but sin makes you dirty on the inside. How about if I do lots and lots of good things? Will that make me clean on the inside? It's nice to do good things, but good things can't remove the sin that's already there. Hmm. So then, what do I have to do to be clean on the inside? It's as easy as A, B, C. A stands for admit. Admit that you have done things that are wrong and that you are a sinner. I've done lots of things that are wrong, so I have to admit that I'm a sinner? What does B stand for? B stands for believe. The Bible tells us in Acts 16, 31, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe means to trust that Jesus is the perfect Son of God and that he died in your place for your sin. It's trusting Jesus as the Savior. I believe that Jesus is God's son and that he is the only way to heaven. Is that all? There's one more thing. C. C stands for confess. To confess is to say the same thing as God. How do I talk to God or like God? You don't talk like God. You agree with him about sin and salvation in Jesus. Do you understand what that means? It means... I get to go to heaven with Jesus? Yippee! Yes, but it also means that you become a child of God. Your parents here on earth are still your parents, but God becomes your heavenly father. Cool. Just as you obey your parents here on earth, as a child of God, 
You should also obey and follow God. How do I follow God? By spending time reading the Bible, talking to him in prayer, and obeying him. If I follow God, does that mean all my problems will go away? No. God never promised that life here on earth would be easy, but he does promise to always be with you and to help you. I really want to be a child of God and follow him. What do I need to do? Simply talk to God. There are no special words, but simply tell him you agree with him that you are a sinner, that you believe Jesus died for your sins. Ask him to forgive you and your, forgive you of your sins and make you a child of God. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, I'm ready. Let's go to church so I can talk to God. You don't need to go to church to talk to God. You can talk to him wherever you are. What happened to the angel food cake I baked for my party tonight? Uh-oh. Uh, I think I'll sneak out and play with my friends next door. Is that what God would want you to do? I guess not. I'll be right back after I talk with my mom. Uh, mom, I think I need to tell you something. Dr. Bartholomew Cause. That's because. That's the joke's voice. <laughs> anyway, today we are going to learn about what Easter is all about. Is there anyone who would like to help? Uh, here am I. Good. Do you have a story you would like to share about Easter? I do. Then go ahead. It's a story about a rose. Are you talking about a flower? Not just a flower, but a very special flower. A special flower? A very beautiful flower. Go on. The rose is red, a dark red. Yes. Much like the blood that Jesus shed for all of us before the cross, and when he was hanging on the cross. I see. And the stem of the rose is wrapped around with thorns, just much like the crown of thorns was wrapped around the head of Jesus. Good example. But even though the rose will eventually die, the green and the leaves and the stem reminds us of the most important story about Easter. Green stands for life. There w was life after the cross. Jesus rose again. He conquered death. And because of that, we will one day conquer death. Are you talking about eternal life? Eternal life awaits on anyone who knows Jesus. So, the red on the rose represents the blood. The thorns represents the crown. And the green on the stem and the leaves represents the resurrection life that will be found in Jesus. Right on. That's a pretty good story about Jesus. There's more. The two words, A plus rose, when put together, tell us the whole story about Easter. Two words become one? When we come to know Jesus, we become one with his, with him. The two become one, and the two words when put together spell one word, arose. He arose. I like it. So the suffering and the sacrifice were not the end. Because there was more. Jesus arose. A new beginning. Thanks, dude, for sharing with us what Easter is truly all about. Right on.
That's a lot harder work than I thought it was. <laughs> oh. All right. Good morning once again. We're going to go ahead. I would invite, if you can, stand to stand. Uh, we're going to sing a song together, reminding us again about Jesus Christ. He is Lord. before your throne once again today, thanking you for the blessings you have given to us. Lord, I thank you for the resurrection account of Jesus Christ. Lord, I know that it gives him victory over death, hell, and the grave. And since he conquered death, hell, and the grave, Lord, he can do the same thing for us. And we have eternal hope in Jesus Christ. Thank you for this day where we can remember what Jesus did for us and the victory that we have in him. Father God, today I just pray again that all distractions be put aside, that our hearts be focused on you and Lord, we be attentive to your word and reverence it in a way that would be pleasing to you. But God, I also pray that your word simply speaks to us through your Holy Spirit. Guide us, and Lord, we just want to give you the glory and praise. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. And we praise you for all that you do. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ, the dear Son, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Have your Bibles, you can open once again to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 15. The past couple of weeks we have been talking about the gospel according to the scriptures. This is part three. This is the resurrection. Two weeks ago we looked at the crucifixion as part of the gospel. Last week we went over how the burial of Jesus Christ is an important part of the gospel. Well, this morning we're going to look at the part of the gospel that gives us a biblical hope. It should be emphasized that biblical hope is not a maybe yes, maybe no kind of issue. It's not like saying, well, I hope the Tigers win the World Series this year. Optimism, with a little bit to substantiate the fact, other than my feelings, doesn't work. Biblical hope is a secured truth which we look forward to. Biblical hope is assurance based on the Word of God and the promise of the Almighty. And the resurrection speaks to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by the which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day 
according to the Scriptures. Jesus raised from the dead according to the Scriptures. That phrase, according to the Scriptures, references the Old Testament. I ask you to turn your Bibles to the book of Psalms. Psalm number 16. Psalm number 16. I want to begin reading in verse number 8. Psalm 16, verse 8. This is a psalm of David, the king of Israel. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. David died, and it has been thousands of years since he died. His body was buried, and by now I'm sure it has decomposed. It is not there. How can David then write, Thou wilt thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Well, the best interpreter of the Bible is the Bible, right? So let's go back over into the New Testament to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter number 2. This is part of the sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse number 22. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Peter mentions Jesus. Jesus who was crucified. These men that he was speaking of, or speaking to, knew about the events of Jesus Christ's crucifixion. Matter of fact, Pentecost, it would have only been about 50 days since those events took place. They knew about Jesus. They knew the miracles of Jesus. They knew what kind of man Jesus was, yet He was betrayed and He was crucified on the cross. And then Peter says, God raised Him up from the dead. And then if you notice verse 25, he reiterates here using... Old Testament Scripture. For David speaketh concerning him. Concerning who? Was David speaking about himself back in Psalm 16? No. He was prophesying of Jesus Christ. And so what we see here is the Bible, interpreting the Bible, that we have Peter referencing Jesus Christ's resurrection was foretold in the Old Testament Scriptures by David when he said, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. The Holy One. Now that was an interesting term too. I looked it up uh, back in Psalm 16 in the Hebrew. It has its root in chesed, which means steadfast love. You could almost translate that the Beloved One. The Beloved One. But the Beloved One would not see corruption. While we're here in Acts chapter 2, drop down to verse number 29. Peter continuing to speak and explain what he's talking about. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. 
Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with him an oath, or t- uh, w- with an oath to him, that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. And when Peter says we are all witnesses, he was talking about that group that was gathered there on the day of Pentecost, the 120 that went out preaching the gospel. They were all eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. His body did not rot away in the grave. He was victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Now there is a wonderful lesson to be taught in the resurrection. I just want to share it really quickly with you. Question, who raised Jesus from the dead? Well, we just read there in Acts chapter 2 and verse 24, whom God hath raised up. And in verse 32 it says, This Jesus hath God raised up. If you go over to chapter 3 and verse 26 of Acts, it says, Unto you first God, having raised up His Son Jesus, sent Him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from His iniquities. Again we see God raising up Jesus from the dead. Acts chapter 5 verse 30, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew, and hanged on a tree. And Acts chapter 10, I know I'm going through these pretty quickly, but Acts chapter 10 and verse number 40, it says, Him God raised up the third day and showed Him openly. Who raised up Jesus? You say, well, God raised up Jesus. Well, I have a question then. Go back to the Gospel of John chapter 2. The Gospel of John chapter 2 Beginning in verse number 19, the Gospel of John, chapter 2, beginning in verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and thou wilt rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore He was risen from the dead, His disciples remembered that He had said this unto them, and they believed the Scripture, that the word which Jesus had said. What did Jesus say? Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. While we're in the Gospel of John, go over to chapter number 10. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 17 and 18. Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse number 17, Jesus speaking, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my Father. Jesus says, I lay my life down, and I take it back. Jesus said He possessed the power to raise Himself. Jesus laid down His life, and Jesus took up His life again. Well, we got God the Father raising Jesus, and now we got Jesus raising Jesus. What about the Holy Spirit? Well, let's go over to the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 3. 1 Peter, chapter number 3. Verse number 18. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. That's the crucifixion. That's where He spilled His blood. That's where He paid the price. That He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Jesus was quickened or made alive by the Spirit. And another verse In the book of Romans, chapter number 8. Romans, chapter number 8. And verse number 11. Romans, chapter 8, verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by the Spirit that dwelleth in you. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead, the Spirit 
raised up Jesus. We've got God the Father raising up Jesus. We've got Jesus Himself raising up Jesus. And we've got the Holy Spirit raising up Jesus. Here's the wonderful lesson. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one. And they loved humanity so much that they together made a way for us to be reconciled unto God. That way is the gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we trust Christ as Savior, God the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us. As we read there in Romans chapter 8, verse number 11, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, when we're saved, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, quickening us, making us alive. We too are then quickened by the Spirit. And this fact, knowing that we have the Holy Spirit within us, the same Holy Spirit that quickened Jesus from the dead, we too will be quickened from the dead. It gives us great hope. And remember, biblical hope is assurance. We too will be quickened. So a simple question to you today on this Resurrection Sunday as we celebrate Jesus coming forth out of the grave. Do you have the assurance of eternal life by believing the gospel? By believing in the substitutionary death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And then, for those of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior, to contemplate what peace we have by knowing that our eternity is settled. Because Jesus came out of the grave, folks, we too can be assured we have eternal life with Him, and we will spend eternity with God. What a great God we have, that He would love us that much, that He would go through all of this to be reconciled to His creation that rebelled against Him. We were made in His image. He loves us. Jesus Christ died for us. He was buried. And praise God, He rose again the third day, giving us eternal hope, eternal assurance. Do you have that eternal assurance today? Let's pray. Father God in heaven, once again we come before your throne, just thanking you for the message of the Scriptures. Lord, I thank you that David prophesied about Messiah, that he would rise from the dead, I thank you that we have the interpretation of that in the book of Acts, clearly pointing not to David himself, but to the Holy One that would come, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we know that he spent, according to prophecy, three days and three nights in the grave. And he came forth victorious, showing us that he had conquered death, that he had conquered the grave, and he has victory. We can say, Lord, O grave, where is thy victory? O oh, death, where is thy sting? Because we know Jesus Christ has conquered these things. And when we put our faith and trust in Him, He gives to us eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. And Lord, I just pray that every person here would have the confidence of knowing that when they pass from this life, they will be in eternity with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. If there's anyone here, Lord, that does not, that does not trust that, I pray today they would recognize their need for a Savior. But Lord, for your children, I pray that we would rejoice in the peace and rejoice in the hope that we have. Our eternity is settled in Christ Jesus. May all people come to know that, and Lord, may all people have such assurance. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice, and we praise you for his resurrection. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.